Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 15 of the Catholics Against Militarism podcast. My name is Ellen, and I will be um, your host today with no guest. I'm going to try to do this solo. Uh, we've had a few guests uh, have to reschedule and cancel lately due to babies being born and things being written and projects being undertaken. And um, so all good things, but um, that leaves me with Nobody for my guest for my guest this week. So I thought I would try something and just try to share with you some of my own thoughts about a few things that have been going on in the past couple of weeks. Actually, in the past week. Um, so the first of those things is that uh, trad Catholics went a bit punk rock this week. In case you were living under a rock or in a cave, you probably heard about the snatching of the Pachamama statues from the church in Vatican City. Um, so the Amazon Synod started on October 3rd, and it came to an end with what some people are calling the splashes heard around the world, when on early Tuesday morning, almost a week ago now, a couple of men, we, I think they were men, I think there were two of them, we don't really know, I don't think, but they went into a church next to St. Peter's Square and took a few of the wooden statues um, out of the church the statues appeared to represent Pachamama, a fertility goddess worshipped by the indigenous people of the Andes. The Vatican at first said they were symbols of life and fertility um, and said they had no idolatrous intentions um, by using them in various ceremonies. Um, but a lot of conservatives and traditional Catholics believed that they were pagan idols. Um, they were previously used earlier in the month in uh, some kind of ceremony in the Vatican Garden where um, the indigenous peoples appeared to be bowing down to them. It was very strange. Um, and there were some other odd things happening at the Synod. I've been following a lot of the coverage of that. Um, the banner with the woman who was like nursing an animal kind of some weird stuff happening, and a lot of Catholics were very confused by it. Anyway, um, a couple of guys in the early morning on Tuesday went into the church, took the statues out, videotaped themselves, uh, absconding with the, with the statues, going to a bridge and throwing the statues into the Tiber River. Well, actually, they set them up on the railing of the bridge and kind of unceremoniously knocked them one by one into the water. Um, so that happened. And then the other thing that was happening this week was the trial of the Kings Bay Plowshares 7. Um, I interviewed three of the seven activists, all Catholic workers, back in the summer on episode 9, if you're interested in checking that out. Um, they were on trial. Um, the charges stemmed from an April 2018 protest at the Naval, Naval Submarine Base in Kings Bay, Georgia one of two home ports for the U.S. Navy's fleet of Trident uh, missile submarines, which carry about half of the U.S. active strategic nuclear warheads. Seven Catholic activists entered the base by cutting through a fence and spent more than two hours on the grounds placing crime scene tape and spilling blood at different locales while posting an indictment charging the military with crimes against peace, citing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. On October 24th, um, they were all found guilty of all charges, including three felonies and one misdemeanor. Um, they will be sentenced in the next 60 to 90 days, and they face up to 20 years in prison. I was wondering if perhaps I was the only Catholic in the world who was paying attention to both of these things happening at the same time. I was following the whole Pachamama thing, I was listening to all the podcasts and commentary about that, and I was also following the trial. And I have to say, I, 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 couldn't, I, I thought I would share some of my observations about some similarities I see between these two things and also some differences. Um, so we can start off with what do these two things have in common? Um, I would say the first thing they have in common is that both of them have a civil uh, an aspect of civil disobedience to them. Civil disobedience meaning... Um, I guess not so much passive resistance. I think we usually think of civil disobedience as passive resistance to a law, like refusal to comply with a law. Um, but in, the, in these cases, it was a bit more than that. It was an active protest. They actively did something um, in hopes of garnering attention 
to something and bringing about change. So I think the goals were somewhat similar in both cases. Um, they both involved destruction of property, what some might call theft or vandalism. Um, and of course, of course, both parties would say they're not guilty of theft, they're not guilty of, of um, crimes for, for various reasons. Um, but some people would see it that way. Both of these parties, the Kings Bay Plowshares uh, 7 and what, what I'll call the Pachamama Poachers, um, they both recorded their actions with video and they obviously wanted their actions to be known to the world. They were, they were doing it uh, in a public way um, to bring attention to something. Um, so that's the first thing they have in common. The second thing I thought I would share is that I, I believe that both of these groups of people, um, the Kings Bay Plowshares being seven people and the Pachamama Poachers being maybe two, believe, I believe that they did what they did out of a love for humanity. Um, both Catholics, both parties Catholics, and I believe they were motivated by a love for humanity. Um, I'm going to read the statement of the Pachamama Poachers, which explains in their own words why they did what they did. They said, this was done for one reason. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, his Blessed Mother, and everybody who follows Christ are being attacked by members of our own church. We do not accept this. We do, we do not longer stay silent. We start to act now because we love humanity. We cannot accept that people of a certain region should not get baptized and therefore are being denied entrance into heaven. It is our duty to follow the words of God like our Holy Mother did. There is not a second way of salvation. Christus vincit, Christus, I, you know what, they say three things in Latin. I'm not going to butcher them. I don't know how to pronounce Latin words. So they say Christ something, Christ something, Christ something in Latin. I should have looked that up beforehand, but I didn't. Um, so they say in their statement, they're doing this for love of humanity. And one of the things they seemed very offended by was the idea that somebody at the synod, I think it was a priest, said he had not baptized um, anybody in the Amazon for over 30 years. Don't quote me on that. I think he said something to that effect. And they were very upset, upset by this, un understandably so. Um, I also believe that the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 were motivated by a love of humanity as well. In their action statement, explaining why they did what they did, they wrote the following. Dr. King said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is my own government. This remains true in the midst of our endless war on terror. The United States has embraced a permanent war economy. Quote, peace through strength is a dangerous lie in a world that includes weapons of mass destruction on hair trigger alert. The weapons from one trident have the capacity to end life as we know it on planet Earth. Nuclear weapons kill every day through our mining, production, testing, storage, and dumping, primarily on indigenous native land. This weapon system is a cocked gun being held to the head of the planet. And that's all I'll read from their statement. So I believe that in both cases we have a similarity. They're both concerned with their love for humanity. Um, perhaps the Pachamama poachers, as I'll call them, um, places a little bit more emphasis on saving souls, um, the spiritual welfare, seemingly, of the people of the Amazon. At least that's what I'm hearing in their statement. Um, but I think they're also protesting against what they see as dangerous, possibly heretical trends in the church. There was a lot more going on at the Synod with um, ideas about women deacons and married priests um, and things like ecological sins um, that were uh, things that are very you know, upsetting to, and, and concerning to Catholics who are more traditional. Um, so, so there is that. And I, I would say that the Kings Bay Plowshares 7 um, are obviously putting more emphasis on the physical survival of the species um, and the protection of God's creation. Um, but it's not without its spiritual component. Um, when I interviewed them back in the summer, they did talk about this idea of kind of this, the, the, the fact of our massive military budget, massive military spending, far exceeding any other country on this planet, um, how that could belie a, a sort of spiritual bankruptcy on the part of the American people. Um, last year, Jesuit father Steve Kelly testified at one of the hearings 
um, that their action was religious and constituted preaching the word of God, that nuclear weapons are sinful. Um, he said, quote, this is a very, very much a crisis, not only of existence, um, he said in his message to base personnel, but your souls are in danger. Um, and so they also were trying to send a message to the people who worked at the base, trying to awaken their conscience to what it was that they were participating in. Um, and they actually left a copy of this book. Don't know if you've heard of it. Um, the Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Um, they left a copy on the base for the people to read. And they felt that their spiritual uh, future was in, in danger. Um, so there's, I do believe there's a spiritual component um, to both. Um, so the first similarity, just to recap um, of things I noticed, was the civil disobedience aspect. Number two would be love of humanity. The third thing I would say that unites, doesn't necessarily unite these two groups of people, but when I was watching the coverage of both of them, it occurred to me um, that, that I do believe that both of their actions are supported by Catholic teaching. I would like to read to you um, from a press statement prepared by Janine Hill Fletcher. She's a professor of the theology, I think, at Fordham University. Um, and she read this to the press. Um, and it's a little bit about Catholic teaching on nuclear weapons. So this, again, was written by Janine Hill Fletcher. For this prophetic action, the Kings Bay Plowshares are being prosecuted for breaking the law. But Doctor of the Church St. Thomas Aquinas made a crucial distinction between a just and an unjust law on the basis of its origin and its end. A just law has as its end human good and, quote, the law does not exceed the power of the lawgiver. Summa Theologica, Part 2, Question 96, Article 4. An unjust law does not have as its end human good and has been created by someone in such a way, quote, that goes beyond the power committed to him. Unquote. A just law, aligned with the natural law of God, makes a demand on our human conscience. An unjust law requires of our conscience that it not be followed. In Aquinas's words, quote, laws may be unjust through being opposed to the divine good. Such are the laws of tyrants inducing to idolatry or to anything else contrary to the divine law. And laws of this kind must nowise be observed because... As stated in Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. Catholic social teaching maintains this distinction between just and unjust laws, as well as the role of conscience in determining the righteousness of law. In the words of Pope John XXIII in Pachum and Terrace, 1963, quote, Laws and decrees passed in contravention of the moral order, and hence of the divine will, can have no binding force in conscience, since... It is right to obey God rather than men. In accordance with the teaching of Jesus found in the New Testament, the Catholic Christian tradition places one law above all others. You shall love your, your God and your you shall love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. The maintenance of nuclear warheads is in direct violation of this law. Catholic social teaching has named nuclear weapons, such as those housed at Kings Bay Naval Base, as quote, offenses against humanity and the common good, unquote. And that's from the Holy See, Nuclear Disarmament, Time for Abolition, 2014. The documents of Vatican II named the use of any weapons, quote, aimed indiscriminately at the destruction of entire cities of extensive areas along with their population, unquote, as, quote, a crime against God and humanity, unquote, that, quote, merits unequivocal and unhesitating condemnation, unquote. Gaudium et spes, number 80. In the words of Pope Francis, the threat of their use, as well as, as well as their very possession, is to be firmly condemned. The principles of Catholic social teaching demand Catholics denounce unjust laws which compromise the dignity of each human person, destroy the common good, fail in our stewardship of the earth, global solidarity, and the promotion of peace. Catholic social teaching has denounced nuclear weapons as contrary to the principles of the faith. In, this, in his message on nuclear disarmament, Pope Francis lifted up the words of Pope John XXIII that the process of disarmament must be thoroughgoing and complete, and it must reach into our very souls. Standing in solidarity with humanity, 
the Kings Bay Plowshares attempted to reach the very souls of fellow Catholics and Christians that we must wake up to the threat of humanity, to the threat to humanity, and the affront to God that is our nuclear weapons arsenal through the sacramental action of sprinkling blood and inscribing the words, love one another. The defendants were motivated by deeply held religious convictions and have acted in accordance with Catholic social teaching and the prophetic call of the Christian tradition. Unquote. So that was a long passage. If, if I could, I would have like interspersed a video of, of Janine Hill Fletcher actually speaking those words. But I'm really not good with videos. <laughs> I just set out to create a podcast. I didn't really set out to be like a YouTube video person. So um, I apologize for my lack of skills. Maybe they will grow as the months go on. Um, but I hope that that is just a snippet from her uh, message to um, the press that helps to explain the actions of the Kings Bay Plowshares activists in the context of Catholic teaching. I think it seems to me that um, the actions of the Pachamama poachers uh, would also be supported by Catholic teaching if those statues were indeed idols. Um, the first commandment is, uh, I am the Lord your God. You should have no other besides me, no other gods besides me. Um, and in the words of our Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Um, so there is a little controversy about whether the statues were in fact idols, but eventually Pope Francis did come out and say he apologized for what happened and he called them the, the Pachamama statues. So Pachamama was indeed a fertility goddess, and so they see, it seems like they did represent a pagan god. Um, so I, I do think there's a pretty good argument to be made that those should belong in a Catholic church. Um, so I, I do think that the actions of both parties were supported by Catholic teaching, in my opinion, for what it's worth. Maybe it's not worth much. Um, so the fourth, uh, the fourth similarity um, would be the response by the United States government and the response by the Vatican. I couldn't help but notice lots of parallels between these two things. And, and, and yes, I will get to the differences in a minute. But um, the coverage of the Pachamama poachers, the Washington Post and AP News um, said something about thieves stealing something from the church. And they wrote that the synod took a criminal twist. Um, so immediately um, categorizing these people as criminals, uh, as I'm sure the Kings Bay Plowshare Seven were seen as criminals when they broke into the base um, and symbolically disarmed the nuclear weapons. Um, in his video at Church Militant, Michael Voris called the response by Rome hypocritical and hysterical. Um, I thought his his video on this was actually really great. I love the way that he calls out the hypocrisy in the church. Somebody's got to do it, and he does it really well. Um, he pointed out that the Vatican was going to call the police to report um, theft of these statues, but he nobody called to report the theft of more than a half billion euros from the Vatican's own accounts by corrupt cardinals. I'm not going to get into that story here, but that's another thing that kind of came out in the last couple of weeks. Um, so the hypocrisy of being really concerned about the theft of these statues and being mum about the theft of the money, you know, obviously it, it is very hypocritical. Um, in the podcast in over the summer, when I interviewed um, the Kings Bay Plowshares, three of them, um, Martha Hennessy, Dorothy Day's granddaughter, Claire Grady, and... Carmen Troda. Um, Carmen said in that episode, he said, we brought an indictment on the base. He said with such passion, I loved it. He says, they accused us of a criminal conspiracy and getting together and going on that base. The larger criminal conspiracy, the real criminal conspiracy is the retention, deployment, and caretaking of the Trident missile submarine. Um, and the crime specifically is that it violates the international treaties of the UN Charter of 1945, the Nuremberg Principles, the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1970. Furthermore, Car Carmen, um, the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 call out um, the government and our country, which we're all part of, um, 
they say that there is 100, $100.2 billion is being planned for the renewal, restoration, and the creation of new nuclear weapons to modernize our nuclear weapons arsenal. $100 billion. And they call this theft. Speaking of theft, um, they call it theft of much needed resources to build 12 new Trident missile submarines. And I never re used to understand that, this idea that the, the money, the insane amounts of money that we use for weapons building in this country could be seen as theft from the poor. That these resources are precious resources and they could be, they could be used for, for better things. Um, and in the Catechism, it says, quote, Spending enormous sums to produce ever new types of weapons impedes efforts to aid needy populations, unquote. Um, so along with um, this idea of hypocrisy, um, destruction of property, destruction of property and um, degradation are two of the felonies that the Kings Bay Plowshares were charged with. Um, they challenged the government's contention that the five of them were a danger to community safety. <laughs> they were called a danger to community safety. And the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 were like, um, you know, the Trident nuclear weapons are the greatest threat to all of God's creation that has ever existed in the world. How can we be, how is that not a danger to the human community? But we are because we cut through a fence and sprinkled some blood. Um, so this idea of hysteria, the reactions being hysterical and hypocritical, I thought that they applied to both, both parties. Um, Sorry, I'm just catching up on my notes here. Um, okay, so here's a few responses um, to the Pachamama poachers that I saw online. I just was looking around at different YouTube videos, different uh, Catholic outlets that were covering it, and seeing what the comments said. Um, so one person on Twitter said, if the thuds in the Vatican um, do press charges against them, um, it will show them how much the faithful rally against them and support the October 21st heroes. Another person said, exactly, they are the real criminals. So this idea that the Vatican putting these idols in a Catholic church, that that is the real crime, not the crime of removing them from the premises. Um, someone else said, is there any way we can press charges against our pagan church leaders for allowing these demonic voodoo images into our church? Someone else said, not a single pedophile rots in Vatican jail, and they want to stick it to the guys removing an idol out of a Roman Catholic church. Um, the hypocrisy, obviously, is really bothering a lot of people. And when I read that, you know, I thought to myself, not a single politician, congressman, general, nobody is rotting in jail uh, for persecuting these preemptive, unjust wars. Um, there's no war criminals that are rotting away in, gen in jail right now. Um, but yet, uh, the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 may spend the rest of their lives in jail. Um, so to me, again, that just seems, it seems to be a parallel to me. Maybe it won't, maybe it won't seem so to you, but um, it certainly seems like a parallel that could be drawn there. Um, someone else says, I'm not licensed to practice, but it to practice there, but it seems there might be an opportunity for a long and public defense of justification. Be careful what you ask for. And someone else said, go ahead, a trial would be a most wonderful thing. So the attitude among Catholics is like, if the Vatican wants to press charges, bring it on. Like, we're going to get these people's backs. The Pachamama poachers will be fully supported, fully legally defended. Um, and this idea that the Vatican should watch what it what it hopes for because, um, watch what it asks, asks for because this could end up backfiring. It was just interesting that they were saying this as the trial of the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 was happening. Um, and they did have a lot of support. Um, but it seems to me that it was not among mainstream, ma the majority of Catholics. It was like kind of a niche group that was back behind them. Um, they had a lot of people go down for the trial. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many, but um, I, I don't think that the Kingsblade Plowshare Sevens they would have this like worldwide international outcry of support the way that the Pachamama po poachers did. 
Um, so we're almost to the part where I'd like to talk about some differences that I've noticed. But I would say the last two similarities between these that I could draw out is the, the first one being that both were committed by lay people in the church. These are not priests, religious nuns. They're just regular folks like you and me. At least I think so. We don't know who the Potch Mama poachers are. Um, they could be priests. We don't know. But I have a feeling that they're lay people. And the final uh, similarity is idolatry. In both of these cases, the people were acting against what they believed or perceived to be um, blatant idolatry. And so I'm going to I'm going to table that and I'm going to come back to that at the end. Uh, quickly, I will just talk about a few of the differences that I noticed between these um, two situations. Um, the first one is that one was directed more at the American government and the American people. So Kings Bay Plowshare 7, this is an act of bringing witness, bringing awareness to something that's very dangerous in the world that doesn't just specifically apply to the Catholic Church. Um, and the second one, the Pachamama Poachers, uh, was directed more specifically at the Catholic Church. Um, one was trying to draw attention to a problem in the world, and one was trying to draw attention to a problem in the church. Um, although I would say that the King Bay, Kings Bay Plowshare 7 um, were trying to awaken, you know, Catholics, um, as well as just everybody. Anybody who worked on the base, anybody who reads the news stories, anybody who wants to read this book, The Doomsday Machine. Um, there's a much broader kind of... Um, goal there. Um, the second difference is that the Pachamama poachers remained anonymous and did not claim their act publicly, while the plowshares uh, activists took responsibility for what they did. Um, the Pachamama poachers kind of absconded with the statues. In the video, their faces aren't shown. We don't, I don't believe we know who they are. Um, I think one guy tried to take credit for it, but I'm not sure if he's the one who did it. Um, and the Kings Bay Plasher 7 remained at the site of the crime and waited to be uh, apprehended by the military police. Um, I'd say that's a pretty big difference. And if I could just add a small opinion, um, I would say that it's more effective to um, put your face and your name out there when you do something like this. I think that it's taken more seriously um, when you believe enough in what you're doing to stand behind it. It's just my opinion. I wish the Pachamama poachers, personally, I wish they would have put their faces on the camera, spoken to the camera, introduced themselves and said, this is why we're doing what we're doing. When you hide, you know, it looks like you have something to hide. It just doesn't look, it's, I, I don't know. That's just my opinion, though. Um, there's also a difference in what the stakes were, what these different parties risked. In, in doing what they did. Um, the Kings Bay Plasher 7 risked their lives to make this statement, to do this action. Um, they went on the base into what was called a limited access area, which is where the activists believe nuclear weapons were stored. Um, it's a deadly force zone um, where the, there's a warning that's blared on the loudspeakers every 10 to 15 minutes telling people this is a deadly force zone. If we catch you here, we have the right to kill you on site. Um, so literally they could have been killed. Um, thank God they weren't. Thank God that the people who saw them knew immediately that they were peaceful activists. They were no threat to anybody and they did not pull the trigger, but it could have happened. Um, the Kings Bay Pleasure 7 also risked their freedom. Um, they risk spending up to 20 years in jail, for which some of them, um, for some of them that could mean the rest of their lives. Um, most of them have families, they have children, they have grandchildren. So they, there's a lot on the line. What did the Pachamama poachers risk? What did they put on the line? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I guess if they got caught eventually, then maybe you could say that um, they might get fined or something. But I don't think you could say that they they were willing to stake as much as the Kings Bay Plowshare 7. Um, there's also a different in, difference in tone that I noticed between these two actions. 
Um, the Kings Bay Plowshare 7, I think they said they prayerfully prepared for this action for over a year. They prayed about it. They talked about it. Um, and you could say they, they prepared for this action their whole lives. I remember uh, when I interviewed them on the podcast, um, I said, why did you do this? Why didn't you just go stand on a street corner with a sign that says, like, honk for peace, you know? And they said, we've done that. We've vigiled. We've prayed. We've written letters. We've done petitions. Um, we've protested. We've spent our whole lives doing that, and nothing has changed. And they felt it was time for them to up the ante, to do something that would possibly garner more attention and really show that they really believed um, that these nuclear weapons have to be destroyed. We have to go back to disarmament. We have to stop building them. Um, the Pachamama poachers, on the other hand, I would say they seemed a little bit more spontaneous. I don't know them. I don't know what they did, but um, there was a difference in tone, and you could hear it when you hear podcasters and YouTube personalities um, talking about it. There's a little bit of a snicker when people talk about it. It's like, he, he, he. Oh no, it's really serious. It's idolatry, but he, he, he. And even the comments were like, I laughed so hard when it fell in the water. I mean, there was just kind of a, I, I believe that those people were motivated by very earnest, you know, intentions. And, you know, I'm not saying I don't support what they did. Um, but I think part of the reason we could take it, we could, we could chuckle and snicker at it is because again, they didn't show their faces. It, it almost seemed a little bit like a college prank. Or something like there was just something about it that wasn't entirely serious as, as, as serious as people want to make it there's always this underlying tone of like something humorous about it um anyway that's just my opinion um the next uh difference is obviously the object of their attention right so there's a few statues that are literally one guy carried all of them in his arms and then threw them in the river like they're weighed maybe what three, four pounds. I mean, they're wooden statues. Um, and the object of um, the Kings Bay Plowshares protests were like, you know, deadly nuclear arsenal that can destroy the planet. I don't know how much those bombs weigh. I'd, I'd, I'd imagine they weigh a ton. Um, so there's just a bit of a, a difference there. Um, and then the value of what was being destroyed um, at the end of the day, the government estimated that the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 did about $30,000 worth of damage. Somebody who was with them, who's done a lot of work, uh, maintenance kind of work, um, handyman kind of stuff, said it was probably more like $75. Uh, you know, like they snipped a fence, they cut a fence, and they painted some stuff. But a few buckets of paint and a new fence is not going to cost $31,000. But even if it did cost $31,000, $31,000 to repair the damage, $100 billion to build new nuclear weapons. Like, it's just not that big of a deal, right? Um, the value of the Pachamama poachers, what they stole, I have no idea. Estimated to be $30? I don't know how, I don't know who would value these things or how much they would cost, but I would imagine not much. Um, the other big difference I noticed between the Potch Mama Poachers stuff and the uh, Kings Bay Plashers action is the publicity and the coverage, of course. I, this is not scientific, okay, you guys, I'm not like a journalist, I'm not a researcher, I've, I do this in my spare time, so take all this with a grain of salt, but I did a quick Google search, I typed in uh, Pachamama in Google News, I touched in, you know, Catholic, and I typed in Kings Bay Plowshares, Catholic, and just briefly looked at who was talking about what. Um, so, for example, LifeSite News. By the way, love LifeSite News, big fan, love what they do, not trying to criticize them at all. I'm simply making the observation that they ran 25 stories on the Pachamama Poachers, zero on the Kings Bay Plowshares, seven. As, as far as I could find, and I hope you guys will double check me. Um, Church Militant did 10 stories on the Pachamama Poachers, zero on Kings Bay Plowshares, seven. Um, Taylor Marshall, who I watch, I'm not trying to criticize, I, I listen to his podcast, I like what he's doing, I want to read his book, seems like a good dude. Um, simply making the observation that six videos so far, I think there was another one this morning that he did on the Pachamama Poachers, zero Kings Bay Plowshares. 
National Catholic Register, I believe they did four on the Potch Mama Poachers, zero on Kings Bay Plowshares. Catholic News Agency, four that I could find on the Potch Mama Poachers, zero on Kings Bay Plowshares. Um, other notable personalities who talked about the Pachamama po Poachers incident, Father Mark Goring, Patrick Coffin, Father Z. As far as I know, none of those people are interested in talking about uh, the Kings Bay Plowshares 7, not that I could see. Um, there was two magazines in the Catholic world that I found, or media outlets, that covered both, which shocked me. Um, the first one was Crux Magazine. Really sorry if I'm supposed to be pronouncing that in some kind of Latin way and I'm not saying it correctly. I was really surprised to find that Crux Magazine did two stories on the Pachamama Poachers and five stories on Kings Bay Plowshares over the course of the past, you know, year and a half. So when I saw that, I actually had to look a little deeper into that. I'm not totally up on all of my, all the various Catholic media and where everybody gets their information, but I looked into it. And I was, I was, because I said, like I said, I thought I was the only Catholic in the world who was paying attention to both of these things. Um, and I have to, I have to put in a little plug here. And you guys probably who are listening to this may know about Crux. Um, apparently they split off from the Boston Globe. And the guy who runs it is John L. Allen Jr. And his work is admired across, across ideological divides. Um, liberal commentator Father Andrew Greeley calls his writing indispensable, while the late Father Richard John Newhouse, a conservative, called his reporting possibly the best source of information on the Vatican published in the United States. And um, his weekly column is called All Things Catholic. I personally think I'm going to start reading that. Um, and I read on their website that they don't want to be the Catholic website for people that like Trump, and they don't want to be the Catholic website for people who hate Trump. They want to cover the whole spectrum. So I was really interested in, in that, because um, that's also, that's what I think is missing in our Catholic world. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this podcast and this channel. Um, although I think we've had more people from the left recently on the podcast, um, but I'm trying to mix it up in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but anyway, I thought that was really cool. And then um, the other magazine that covered both the Pachamama Poachers with one story and the Kings Bay Plowshares with two, two or three stories was America Magazine, the Jesuit Magazine. Um, the National Catholic Reporter has zero stories on the Pachamama Poachers and more than 10 on the Kings Bay Plowshares. So they've been covering that. Um, there was also a difference in the fact that obviously more Catholic media was covering the Pachamama Poacher incident, um, but it was a worldwide international story in the secular press. It was covered in Breitbart, Canada Free Press, Esquire. Um, but overall, I would say that there were far more media outlets, secular media outlets that were interested in the Kings Bay Plowshares than Catholic media outlets. And I don't mean to lump in people like Taylor Marshall or Patrick Coffin with like journalists or, you know, they're, they're more like commentators, but um, some of the secular uh, press that covered the Kings Bay Plowshares was Democracy Now!, Newsweek, The Ithaca Voice, because Claire Grady is from Ithaca. Um, so they had a great series that they did. Um, Antiwar.com, Common Dreams, Washington Post, The Intercept. Um, so a lot more secular interest in the Kings Bay um, act, activists than Catholic interests. Finally, uh, the, 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 the last kind of contrast I noted um, is between the reactions and the responses among Catholics to these two groups of people. Um, I'm going to pause here because I have to go deal with my students right now. I'll be back um, in a second. All right, we're back. Um, all right, so we're talking about differences. This is the final difference that I kind of noticed between, was in the reaction to these two groups of people. Um, here are some comments that I saw online. Again, this isn't scientific. I just kind of perused various YouTube channels and articles. And this is the gist of what I found, um, reaction to the Pachamama poachers. Praise be Jesus Christ. These men are heroes for the Lord. 
Fultnersheen was right in saying, do not look to the bishops or priests to save the church. The laity will have to step up. God bless you, sirs. Soldiers of Christ, we salute you. Long live Christ the King, down with the false gods. Catholic warriors, heroes. Ironic, isn't it? These pagans worship a so-called fertility goddess, then turn around and commit infanticide. Pachamama, not your mama. God bless you for this courageous act of true faith. This single act has given me so much hope. Countless times in the Old Testament, God the Father sent his people in to destroy the pagan idols. This is no different. All it takes is for lay people to have the conviction to stand up and say no to the folly. Thank you for this inspiration. Finally, finally, someone with a spine, a brain, and a soul. A righteous act of civil disobedience, indeed, a good start. Now that's Catholic action and fighting the good fight for God. Somebody with a set of cojones finally did what needed to be do what needed doing. Go back and clear the rest of that garbage. God bless you. I predict this man is going to be put into prison for breaking, entering, and possibly a level of theft. Um, this man may very well be a martyr, sacrificing his freedom for the church and for our Lord. The assault succeeded precisely because it was not organized. Don't expect any clergy to aid or assist in the war. Don't try to aggregate numbers. Don't go for public protest like superficial show-ups. Take real action everywhere. Random acts of Catholic militancy performed by small or unitary contingents all hours of the day and night. Publish your good works in the sight of men. Christ is the general. Do all for him in his holy name. God bless the soldiers of Christ who have shown us what individuals can do. Viva Cristo Rey. Absolute legends. No purgatory for those guys. Straight to heaven for them. This is the day the Lord has made. I will help support the brave Catholic men who threw Pachamama in the Tiber if they are arrested. Yes, during dark times, the Lord raises up saints and warriors. So that was the general... That's most of what I saw um, on the internet, just nothing but full-blown support, excitement. It, people were inspired by this. Um, so, I, I again, this isn't scientific, but I did look. Um, most of the articles that I could find online about the Plowshares, Kings Bay Plowshares 7 actions, they didn't allow for comments. The one magazine that did allow for comments was America Magazine. So I took some of these comments um, on their actions from American Magazine, and I think you'll see the difference. So here's one. No one should be for nuclear weapons, but if only one power-hungry group has them, then the rest of the world will be held hostage and enslaved. Catholics will not prosper in such a scenario. It will always be possible to find a theologian who will support any position one comes up with. For example, pacifism leads to massive killing, but is justified by many theologians. They wouldn't protest anything if they were not able to clothe themselves in their own personal glory. The pre-protest selfie was an example of this. And once again, everyone's favorite servant of God and avowed anarchist Dorothy Day is mentioned. I'm beginning to wonder if the concept of a professor of theology is actually just a sham. Is it really about God or is it all about the professor? The original draft card burning action of the Catonsville, Catonsville 9 troubled both Merton and Dorothy Day. Merton expressed concern about elements of the Catholic peace movement denigrating into the violent terrorism of groups like the Weather Underground. Quote, now nonviolent, now flower power, now burn baby, all sweetness on Tuesday and all hellfire on Wednesday, he wrote in his journal. Catholics used to support war when it was U.S. versus fascism. That war led to the nu nuclear age. Now Catholics are expected to be nonviolent, yet the article oddly claims, quote, they vandalized nuclear warheads in a nonviolent direct action. Violent is defined as, quote, marked by the use of unusually harmful or destructive physical force, unquote. Breaking in and damaging things not belonging to them would certainly qualify as violence. Um... Illegally entering a military installation and defacing and vandalizing property, regardless of the underlying motives, are criminal actions and should be dealt with accordingly. Being a Catholic plowshares activist is not exempt from the one from the consequences. It's as simple as that. 
It should be noted that they are not on trial for an anti-nuclear protest. They are on trial for charges of conspiracy, destruction of property, and trespass. Why don't these protesters take their protests to Russia, China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan, and the other nuclear powers, and the wannabe Iran? See how they treat their protesters. So, I don't think any commentary is needed. I think the differences between the reactions are obvious. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. Um, here's a few thought experiments for you. These are just a few things that I thought this week as I was listening to the coverage of these two events and seeing so many similarities um, and a few differences. Um, the first one is this idea of the demonic. So a lot of people were saying that those statues were demonic because they were pagan idols um, and they referenced the infanticide and the um, human sacrifice that often was a part of almost every ancient culture and pagan culture. Um, so referencing infanticide and obviously the horrors of abortion um, and infanticide. And the Kingsbury Plowshares are talking about omnicide. So the idea of the entire world getting blown up by these nuclear weapons that we can produce now with our technology and our progress. Um, so would we call that demonic? The potential for omnicide. Is that something... Do these weapons come from, come from God, from Jesus? Do they come from the Holy Spirit? Or are they, in fact, too demonic? Um, it's a thought experiment, you guys. I'm just throwing it out there. You can think about it. You can tell me I'm crazy. and That's fine. Um, but why are we so quick to say that this wooden statue is demonic, but when we talk about these weapons, you know, it's like, there's no end to the number of defenses and justifications we can come up with for their existence, right? The other thing I was thinking, as I was listening to, um, to uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall talk with Tim Gordon, um, they brought up First and Second Maccabees. Again, I wouldn't be talking about their podcast if I didn't listen to it. I, I'm a fan of theirs. I listen to their podcasts. I like what they're doing. But I couldn't help thinking when, they're, when they brought up 1st and 2nd Maccabees, um, Dr. Taylor Marshall said, two of the main characters are an old man who refuses to eat pork and goes to his death, and then a woman with her seven sons, people you wouldn't expect to be the heroes in the story. They are the great heroes. You might be thinking, I'm just a mom, or I'm just an elderly person. He says, go read Maccabees. Those were the people God chose to be the martyrs, the heroes, the mascots of the day, the mascots of the age. Um, so I couldn't help thinking about the King's Bay Plowshares as he was saying that um, and wondering, would he apply that same, ex you know, would, it, would, he, would he think of them in the same way that he would think of the Pachamama poachers, right? Um, the King's Bay Plowshare 7s, I, 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 I forgot to look up their ages before I started the recording. Um, but I think Liz McAllister is 79. I think Martha Hennessy and Claire Grady are in their late 60s. Um, we were laughing on the podcast that I did with them because they said that the people in jail were calling them the gangster grannies, that they were getting out there. They were putting their life on the line. They were putting their freedom on the line, and they are elderly people. And so when I thought about that, they certainly don't act it, though. It's really kind of interesting. Um, 65 isn't what it used to be. I remember when my grandparents were 65, it was a totally different story. But, um, you know, it's just a different time now. But I, I couldn't help thinking about that. You know, I was thinking that applies to the King's Bay Plowshares, what they're saying about Maccabees. Um, yeah, so that, that just occurred to me. Um, and this idea of theft, too, as I was listening to a podcast um, a doctor at Dr. Marshall's YouTube channel, he was talking about theft, and he said, imagine you have a roommate in your home. Your roommate's away for the weekend. You're going through some kitchen drawers, and you find $2,000 worth of heroin. That's a lot of money. You flush it down the toilet. You're such a thief. You stole. You destroyed property. Get out of my face. <laughs> I like the way those guys talk. I just like it. He says the problem is that it's heroin. The value is that it's wrapped up in something that is evil and it's going to hurt your roommate or other people or kids down the block if it's sold to them. 
it must be taken away and destroyed. No one calls that theft. Um, so as I'm as I'm hearing him talking about this, I'm thinking about the Kings Bay Plowshares Seven, and I'm thinking if it's okay to steal, you know, or vandalize two thousand dollars worth of heroin because it's destructive and it has this negative value. Uh, would he, you know, as a thought experiment, you know, would he apply that same rule to the Kings Bay Plowshare Seven and what they did using that same kind of rationale or justification? I don't know, but it, it just made me think of that. Um, how much worse is nuclear weapon that could kill, again, as it says in the catechism, entire populations of entire cities, all the elderly people, the children, the unborn babies, everyone, right? That, that's definitely worse than $2,000 worth of heroin, right? Um, so they say the heroin example is perfect because, look, it's a gift given from some pagan idolaters to a party who should not have accepted it, who did not have the right to accept it. The Pope doesn't have a right to do whatever he wants. And, you know, they make, they make some, good, some good points there. Um, they say, it's like heroin, the statues in the church. It's like heroin, a deeply, deeply, deeply noxious object. Um, so yeah, as they're talking about the theft of the statues, I'm thinking about the nuclear weapons that Kings Bay Plowshare 7 were trying to, it's their view that we should get rid of these, that these two are deeply, deeply, deeply noxious objects. But I'm just wondering, you know, would the same uh, logic be applied? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. And I'm sure if I emailed them, I, my email would be one of 50,000 that they get every day. But it's just, again, a thought experiment, you know. Um, it's just interesting to think about. Um, one other thing they said is you would never call St. Boniface a thief or a vandal. It doesn't apply. Um, and they were talking a lot about, oh, another quote I really liked is, it's an occasion of sin, right? The statues in the church. It's an occasion of sin. It's an occasion of sin for the Pope. It's an occasion of sin for the Cardinals. And it's an occasion of sin for the entire world. They must be destroyed. They must be cast away. Could we apply that same thinking to the nuclear weapons that the Kings Bay Plowshares 7 were um, speaking out against? That they too are an occasion of sin, grave, grave sin for the whole world, that they too should be destroyed, that they too should be gotten rid of, just like the statues in the church or like the heroin that you might find in your kitchen. I would argue yes, but maybe you wouldn't, so I'm sure I'll hear from some of you in the comments. Um, when he's talking about St. Boniface, he's talking about this time when St. Boniface cut down the sacred oak. Um, so um, St. Boniface attempted to cut down an oak that was the oak of Jupiter or Thor, the pagan god of Thor, somewhere in like the Germanic territories of Europe. Um, and he did this in front of the pagans. And he was... Dr. Marshall, Marshall was using this example to try to support the actions of the Pachamama poachers. This idea that destruction of idols is something that we should do as Catholics. Um, and I'm sure I'll hear maybe from some Protestants who will be more than happy to tell me uh, about idolatry, right? Um, but it's interesting, though, because I don't think that Dr. Marshall told the whole story of St. Boniface. He only focused on this cutting down of the tree of Thor. But I, I, I did look into it a little bit. Um, and really, so this is about, in six, he was born in 675 in Britain. And St. Boniface was a man who excelled primarily at languages. He wanted to become a monk from a very young age, and he was just brilliant with words. And he could learn any language, he could speak any language. Um, in the year 710, at the age of 30, he was ordained. And in 718, he ended up going to Rome. It really sounds like an incredibly, an incredible story um, to just go from Britain to Rome in those days, probably on the Roman roads that had been built by the Romans, but still, um, basically just walking going on foot, um, hoping to, to uh, depending on the charity of strangers and whatnot. Um, so anyway, in, 17, in 718, he went to Rome. He wanted to be a missionary. Um, and after several months of study, he was sent to Germany um, in Bavaria. 
and he spread the gospel among the German pagans using his extraordinary gift of language and persuasion. And he ended up establishing a community in Hessen. But that is primarily what he did, what St. Boniface did. He persuaded the pagans. Um, he talked to them in their own language and he persuaded them about the truth of the gospel. And he did that, it sounds like, from 718, and, and then in 722, uh, Pope Gregory made him a bishop. Um, so he went to Rome again, was made a bishop. This is four years after he became a missionary in Germany. And when he came back in 722, he made the bold gesture of cutting down the Oak of Thor, or the Oak of Jupiter, um, the god of thunder. Now, the story that I read said that he actually did this with the pagans that he was already living with for four years and had already spent four years basically, um, you know, testifying and witnessing to them and establish, helping them, you know, acts of charity, but mostly persuasion. Um, and so it was only four years later after they knew him, after he had set, established a dialogue, that he decided to kind of make this final gesture of cutting ties with their old pagan rites and their old pagan beliefs. Um, and I just, you know, I think that's important in this whole conversation that I'm having with myself today. Um, it's important to acknowledge that he didn't just walk into pagan territory and like, oh, let me show you guys, I'm going to cut down this thing that's sacred to you. It was only after four years of preaching the gospel to them and, and using his gift of language to communicate with him that he kind of did that as like a final act of, let me show you guys, if we cut down this tree, Thor is not going to strike you with lightning. So he cut down the tree, they did not get struck with lightning, and then a ton more of them were baptized on that day, according to legend. Uh, and it's also interesting to note that in 754, as his followers prepared to defend themselves, he rebuked them, saying, oh, this was when he was getting killed. So this is uh, 30, 32 years later. I hate math. 722 to 754. So he died in 754 and he was attacked by pagan tribes um, and his followers were preparing to defend themselves, defend their lives. And he rebuked them and he said, sons, cease fighting, lay down your arms for we are told in, in scripture not to render evil for good, but to overcome evil with good. He and his followers were martyred. Um, Dr. Marshall also mentioned, and again, not trying to attack Dr. Marshall, really like what he's doing. It's, these are the things that I, made me think about. As I was listening to him and thinking about Kings Bay plowshares and thinking about Pashamama, I don't want to make any enemies with anyone. Um, but St. Benedict, he talked about St. Benedict too, um, destroying a temple dedicated to Apollo. Um, this was around 529 AD. And he cut down the trees in the sacred groves and built a church in place of where this old temple of Apollo was. Um, and he dedicated that church to St. Martin of Tours and had a chapel built in honor of St. John the Baptist. So again, using these guys as kind of representatives of um, destroying icons, destroying idolatry, um, bringing Christianity to the pagans, etc., And sort of being fearlessly, you know, fearless and unafraid of, of, of destroying these idols or these temples. Um, so I just thought I would talk briefly about St. Martin of Tours because that is the saint that he had dedicated this church to once he destroyed the Temple of Apollo. St. Martin of Tours was born in 316. He was a pagan son of a pagan soldier. And during that time, it was required by imperial law that if you were the son of someone in the military, you had to enter military service. You inherited this obligation. So St. Martin of Tours did become a soldier. He was in Gaul when it was being overrun by the barbarians, and he was called up for duty to defend his land. But by this time, he had converted to Christianity, um, and he sought to be discharged. When the local military, Caesar, whoever it was at the time, um, came, came along and tried to give him his bonus pay for being a soldier in the army, he stood up and said, no, he is the patron saint of conscientious objectors. He said, Caesar, hitherto I have served you as a soldier. Allow me now to become a soldier to God. 
Let the man who is to serve thee receive thy donation. I am the soldier of Christ. It is not lawful for me to fight. So at that point, whoever Caesar was accused him of being afraid. He's like, oh, you're just a chicken. You don't want to fight in the battle anymore against the barbarians because you're, you're weak and you're afraid. And at that point, St. Martin of Tours said, I'm actually not. I am. He pulled a Desmond Doss, if any of you guys saw Hacksaw Ridge. Um, he pulled a Desmond Doss and he said, I'll walk out there tomorrow onto the battlefield and go in the front row without my sword, without my armor. God will protect me. I want to show you I am not fearful. I simply do not believe that I can serve in your army anymore because I am now a baptized Christian. Um, luckily, the next day, the, ba the barbarians withdrew. And St. Martin of Tours never did have to prove himself by going out into the front lines like Desmond Doss with no weapons. Um, but anyway, then after that, he became a hermit, and he was eventually called out of seclusion and named a bishop. So um, the idea, too, behind this early monastic movement, um, I think it's important to note. These guys weren't like necessarily going around like punk rockers, just like smashing idols. In fact, they were they were very nonviolent, and that that's part of the idea behind the whole uh, establishment of the mon monastic tradition was that it offered an alternative to the kind of military um, lifestyle and military service. So I want to read something to you. This is about St. Anthony, actually. Um, as a member of the new... Oh, this is a really good book, by the way, called um, The Catholic Peace Tradition. And it says, As a member of the new Militia Christi in the vanguard against evil... The monk became an active alternative to the soldier. By focusing on the inner struggle, Anthony replaced the appeal of physical violence with the heroism of ethical conflict. By refocusing on Christ's spiritual kingdom and his community of peace, the monk offered a stark contrast to the Christian empire of Constantine and Asubius, and once again affirmed Christ's message of peacemaking as an active alternative to the temptations of political power. And in talking about Martin of Tours, um, he says that his, his biography portrays St. Martin of Tours' life as a movement of protest against militarism. The ascetic Militia Christi of that age represented not a refinement, but a flat repudiation of militarism. Martin adopted monasticism partly at least in order to affirm the nonviolent way of life. Nonviolence would be an essential element of the monastic revolt against militarism for the next thousand years. Thought that was interesting. So um, when I was listening to them talking about the St. Boniface and St. Martin of Tours, and um, you know, I just thought there's kind of a piece of the story that's missing here. <laughs> Um, you know, they didn't just go smashing, you know, smashing the sacred things of other cultures, like out of nowhere, right? I mean, they kind of worked with the people and they were, they were missionaries and they preached the gospel and that was, you know, cutting down the oak of Jupiter was just a final act um, of helping them to sever their, tile, their ties with their old religion. I wanted to read too, um, Tertullian wrote a, a work called On Idolatry. I know he's He's controversial because he eventually became a heretic, but there was a good portion of his life when he was not um, in schism with the church and he was writing things that were orthodox. And I I'm 99% sure that his work on idolatry was one of them. And I thought that as we're talking about idolatry, this would be a good paragraph to consider. Most men simply regard idolatry as to be interpreted in, these, in the senses alone. For example, if one burns incense, or immolates a victim, or gives a sacrificial banquet, or is bound to some sacred functions or priesthoods, just as if one were to regard adultery as to be accounted in kisses, and in embraces, and in actual fleshly contact, or murder as to be reckoned only in the shedding of blood for blood, in the shedding forth of blood, and in the actual taking away of life. But how far wider in extent the Lord assigns to those crimes, we are sure. When he defines adultery to consist even in concupiscence, Matthew 5, 28, and stirred his soul, um, when he judges murder, Matthew 5, 22, to consist even in a word of curse or of reproach, 
and in every impulse of anger, and in the neglect of charity toward a brother, just as John teaches, 1 John 3.15, that he who hates his brother is a murderer. Else both the devil's ingenuity in malice and God the Lord's in the discipline by which he fortifies us against the devil's depths, Revelation 2.24, would have but limited scope. If we were judged only in such faults as even the heathen nations have decreed punishable, how will our righteousness abound above that of the scribes and Pharisees, as the Lord has prescribed, Matthew 5.20, unless we shall have seen through the abundance of that adversary quality, that is, of unrighteousness? But if the head of unri unrighteousness is idolatry, the first point is that we be fortified against the abundance of idolatry, while we recognize it not only in its palpable manifestations. So what I hear Tertullian saying here is that idolatry, just like um, murder in the most obvious manifestation would be me killing you physically. What our Lord is calling us to, that you can kill somebody, it's the same thing if you're angry with your brother or if you insult your brother or call him a name. Um, it's, it's really much bigger than just the physical act. And I think the point he's making about idolatry here is the same thing, that yes, it, it's bad if there's a wooden pagan idol in a Catholic church, but that's only the most obvious physical palpable manifestation of idolatry. And just like, you know, what the Lord teaches about adultery and murder, um, idolatry can really be so much bigger than just golden calves and wooden statues, right? It's interesting that Tertullian in this uh, essay has a section on military service. And this is where the famous saying um, comes from, you may have heard it before, Christ in disarming Peter disarmed every soldier. He writes, there is no agreement between the divine and the human sacrament. The divine sacrament being the sacrifice of, of Jesus and the human sacrifice, sacrament meaning, as in terms of what I've learned 24 hours of researching this, the human sacrament means military service, um, giving sacrifice for one's um, country. There is no agreement between the divine and the human sacrament, the standard of Christ and the standard of the devil, the camp of light and the camp of darkness. One soul cannot be two masters, cannot be due to two masters, God and Caesar. And yet Moses carried a rod, and Aaron wore a buckle, and John the Baptist is girt with leather, and Joshua the son of Nun leads a nine of march. And the people warred, if it pleases you to sport with the subject. But how will a Christian man war? Nay, how will he serve even in peace without a sword, which the Lord has taken away? For albeit soldiers had come unto John and had received the formula of their rule, albeit likewise a centurion had believed, still the Lord afterward in disarming Peter disarmed every soldier. Where am I going with this? Um, I should probably wrap it up pretty soon. But the point could be made that idolatry could be more than just wooden statues. Captain Obvious, right? Thank you. Um, but, you know, I, I think it, 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 bears, it bears repeating. Um, another thing I was thinking of is, is this passage of Tertullian, where he says there's no agreement between the divine and the human sacrifice, the standard of Christ and the standard of, devil, of the devil. That's exactly a lot of what I've heard from Taylor Marshall in the past 48 hours or three to four days. He quotes 1 Corinthians 10, 21, you cannot drink the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. You cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord and the table of devils. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, and what agreement hath the, te hath, hath the temple of God with idols? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know you not that the unjust shall not possess the kingdom of God? Do not err, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor liars with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor railers, nor extortioners shall possess the kingdom of God. And such some of you were, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. When he talked about, when, you know, this letter to the Corinthians talks about extortioners, the other thing that ran through my mind this week was um, what Daniel Ellsberg points out. 
in this book that you should read, The Doomsday Machine. Um, it's really, really, it's really, really relevant, I think. He says that there's a myth that a lot of people aren't concerned about nuclear warfare and nuclear weapons and things like that because they think it's a, a thing of the past. Like, it's irrelevant now. Like, no one's ever going to use them. We all know that. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, what Daniel Ellsberg points out in this book is this idea of extortion, right? Extortion being the practice of obtaining something, especially money, through force or threats. He writes, during the 2016 presidential campaign, um, Donald Trump was reported to have asked a foreign policy advisor about nuclear weapons. If we have them, why can't we use them? This was his question. The correct answer, according to Daniel Ellsberg, we do. Contrary to the cliche that no nuclear weapons have been used since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, U.S. presidents have used our nuclear weapons dozens of times in crises, mostly in secret from the American public, though not from adversaries. They have used them in the precise way that a gun is used when it is pointed at someone in a confrontation, whether or not the trigger is pulled. To get one's way without pulling the trigger is a major purpose for owning the gun. And then he talks about extended deterrence. Um, but basically this idea of extortion, um, that this is the way that nuclear weapons are being used, um, is a, as, a, as a gun pointed at somebody's head. So to say that we haven't used them or we don't use them is a lie. Um, and he does a great job of talking about that. I'm only through about half of the book. Um, so far it's been illuminating to say the least. Another thing that occurred to me, <laughs> a lot of thoughts this week, is this idea of modernism, right? This, this, I hear a lot of the traditional Catholics and the conservative Catholics like railing against modernism all the time. The first characteristic associated with modernism is nihilism, the rejection of all religious and moral principles as the only means of obtaining social progress. The modernists repudiated the moral, the moral codes of the society in which they were living, eyed with skepticism, if not, disdain, if not disdain, every traditional idea that had been held sacred by Western civilization. They wanted nothing to do with, the, with any connection to the established order. So this idea of nihilism. Um, the atomic bomb is the apex of modernism. It's the ultimate symbol of the culture of death. Um, it is the, the way that we could destroy life on planet Earth. It's, and it's interesting to me, and sad, a little bit sad, that, um, that, that outlets like LifeSite News, as much good as they do, and I do read them all the time and I support them, the fact that, you know, omnicide, potential omnicide, um, and this kind of apex of nihilism and the culture of death can never be mentioned alongside um, the other things that we associate with the culture of death, like abortion and euthanasia. We have to just like draw the line there. That's the culture of death, right? This massive change in human, human civilization and change in human life, this apex of modernism, this, this absolute symbol of the culture of death, the atomic bomb in the nuclear age cannot be talked about as part of the culture of death nor can military suicides, unjust wars, sanctions that kill tons of children and civil civilians. These things cannot be talked about as part of the culture of death. And that, I think, is a problem. I do think it's a problem when liberals try to um, tack on every imaginable um, Democratic Party platform issue into pro-life and say it's all a matter of pro-life. I think that does water down the abortion issue. But I think when we're actually dealing with life and death, um, capital punishment, potential omnicide, um, nuclear warfare, the building of these weapons, um, which only encourages more, the using of these weapons for extortion, which only encourages more countries to want to have them so they can have that power too, that's the culture of death too. And I wish we, we our traditional and conservative Catholics would, would talk about that once in a while. Um, maybe one, you know, one article on omnicide and, and Kings Bay plowshares for every 100 on infanticide and abortion would, would, would be good for me. I would be happy with that. Um, at least it would be a start. Um, the other thing I was thinking of, I'm about to wrap it up, I promise. Like, I just had a lot of thoughts this week. 
I hope they are in some way helpful to you. And I know that my listeners, at least on YouTube, will, will definitely tell me if they disagree with me on these things. And I always read your comments, and I, I do appreciate them. And if you happen to still be listening to this, thank you. Um, the final thing that occurred to me was um, talking about salvation. In the Pachamama Poachers statement, they made the statement, there is not a second way of salvation. This idea that you can't get to heaven through any variety of possible cultural, religious ways. Like, there's one way. Um, and, and we believe that Catholicism is the one true faith. There's no second way of salvation. That got me going and thinking as I was pondering. Um, and I went back and I looked up a speech that was given by George Zabelka at a Pax Christi conference in August of 1985. And in this speech, Father George Zabelka, if you've never heard of him, was a Catholic chaplain with the, with the U.S. Air Force. And he served as a priest for the airmen who dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. As their chaplain, he gave them his blessing and said, go ahead and do this. Um, now, you could say that the first time they dropped it, they didn't know exactly what they were doing. But by the time August 9th rolled around and they dropped it on Nagasaki, there was no pretending. People didn't know exactly what they were doing. And this is what he said. As a Catholic chaplain, I watched as the boxcar, piloted by good Irish Catholic pilot, dropped the bomb on Yurakami Cathedral, Yurakami Cathedral in Nagasaki, the center of Catholicism in Japan. I knew that St. Francis Xavier, centuries before, had brought the Catholic faith to Japan. I knew that schools, churches, and religious orders were annihilated, and yet I said nothing. Thank God that I'm able to stand here today and speak out against war at all war. The prophets of the Old Testament spoke out against all false gods of silver, gold, and metal. Today we are worshiping the gods of metal, the bomb. We are putting our trust in physical power, militarism, and nationalism. The bomb, not God, is our security and our strength. The prophets of the Old Testament said simply, Do not put your trust in chariots and weapons, but put your trust in God. Their message was simple, and so is mine. We must... We must all become prophets. I really mean that. We must all do something for peace. We must stop this insanity of worshiping the gods of metal. We must take a stand against evil and idolatry. This is our destiny at the most crucial time of human history. But it's also the greatest opportunity ever offered to any group of people in the history of our world to save our world from complete annihilation. I wish, I wish I heard this kind of passion um, coming from, you know, more Catholic outlets about this issue. Sometimes it seems like the whole issue of war and militarism is just this big blind spot for those on the right in the traditional camp. It's like they just don't even see it. Um, we all have our blind spots, of course. I certainly have mine. Um, but we have got to overcome this somehow. It seems to me that I may offer one final thing. I keep saying that. But I think the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 and the Pachamama Poachers, they're not that different. As I've tried to make the point, they're, it's, it's, it's almost like it's a horseshoe, right? And like they're both on this Catholic spectrum and they, they might, it's the traditional Catholics and the Birkenstock wearing, you know, gangster granny, liberal Catholics over here. Um, it might seem like they're totally different, but I think it's more like a, it's a spectrum and it's like a horseshoe and it bends toward each other. And at the top, they're actually much closer to each other than we'd like to admit. But this gap it, it, between them, it just needs to be bridged somehow. And I don't know how to do that. It's frustrating. Um, I will end finally, <laughs> this is the last thing, with a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And it's called The Challenge of Thor. And remember, it was the the god of thunder, Thor, the pagan god that, that the oak tree that Boniface cut down was dedicated to. So here's the poem. I am the god Thor. I am the war god. I am the thunderer. Here in my northland, my vastness, my fastness and fortress reign I forever. Here amid icebergs rule I nations. This is my hammer. Mwelner, the mighty. Giants and sorcerers cannot withstand it. 
These are the gauntlets wherewith I wield it and hurl it afar off. This is my girdle. Whenever I brace it, strength is redoubled. The light thou beholdst stream through the heavens in flashes of crimson is but my red beard blown by the night wind affrighting the nations. Jove is my brother, mine eyes are the lightning, the wheels of my chariot roll in the thunder, the blows of my hammer ring in the earthquake. Force rules the world still, has ruled it, shall rule it, meekness is weakness, strength is triumphant, over the whole earth, still it is Thor's day. Thou art a god too, O Galilean, and thus single-handed unto the combat, Gauntlet or gospel, here I defy thee.